This Bible question is an excerpt from our television program, What Do the Scriptures Say? We hope that it will enrich your spiritual life, and we hope that you'll come back to www.scripturesay.com to find answers to your Bible questions. Thank you. All right, let me remind you of where we are in Mark 5. We had Jairus coming to Jesus and bowing at his feet. Kind of an unusual thing for a leader of a synagogue to do, and last week we discussed that in, in detail. It reminds me to tell you that if you, if you need an audio copy of our program, they're free, they're on CDs. Call or write to us and we'll get those to you. It would be helpful for you to go back and review uh, that lesson before you hear the rest of this one. I'm, I'm sorry we can't always put these lessons all together, but we, we have limited time and we can't. But here's, here's the point I want you to see as we go into the rest of the story here. Jairus is a synagogue official. He, his daughter is dying. He comes to Jesus. And the reason he comes to Jesus is because that the, the pride that he has has all been stripped away through the suffering that he's endured being concerned about his daughter. And so he comes to Jesus and bows before him. Very unusual thing for a Jewish leader to do to, to Jesus. After all, they're out to get him. And he begs Jesus, pleads with him to go to his home to heal his daughter. And Jesus consents to go. And as they begin to go, a woman, you remember the story, sneaks up in the crowd and touches him. Her faith says, if I just touch him, I'm going to be healed. She's had this hemorrhage for 12 years, gone to doctors. The scripture says she's never been better. Doctors haven't helped her. She's been worse. She's gotten worse. So her faith drives her. Once she hears about Jesus, to seek him out and to sneak up in the crowd. This woman would have been known in the community as someone who was unclean, ceremonially unclean. Anyone who had any contact with her would thereby be rendered ceremonially unclean. In the Jewish culture, that was a huge thing, so she was an outcast. The reason why she sneaks up to Jesus. And the points that I was making at the end of last program are, are these. We need to understand, as Mark 5 and verse 27 says, when she heard about Jesus, she came to him. That's something that we take so lightly. People need to hear about Jesus in order to be brought to Jesus. And I'm afraid we're living in a time where we think that everybody has heard about Jesus in our culture, so here we are. Churches establish themselves and they say, you know, uh, here we are. You've heard about Jesus, come to us if you want uh, this, that, or the other thing. But I, I, I want you to think about that for, for a moment. People have to hear about Jesus before they come to Jesus. And just because they know about Jesus in, in some kind of abstract way doesn't mean that they've heard about Jesus. Christianity is an intellectual religion. By that I mean it must be taught and you must know before you come to Christ. It has to be taught and applied. Someone has to teach you about Jesus and who he is before you come to him. And we should never take it for granted in the world that we live in that just because we live in a, quote, Christian world that people know about Jesus because they don't. They don't know the first thing about him. They need to be taught him. And, and then there's a second thing. She, when she heard about Jesus, she came to Jesus. But coming to Jesus takes courage. And I want to talk about that for a couple of moments when we come back right after this. Here's the second thing we need to really see about this woman and her relationship is that coming to Jesus 
takes courage. It took courage for her to, to fight the social norms, to seek him out, to try to touch his garment so that she might be healed. It took courage for her to face that community and try to receive the healing that she in her heart knew would, would occur if she just touched his garment. But I want to suggest to you that it always takes courage to become a Christian. Uh, Christianity is not for those who are cowardly because Christianity requires conviction and courage. Revelation 21 and verse 8, verse 8 mentions a whole list of those who will have their existence separate from God. And at the top of the list are the cowardly. It, it takes courage to be a Christian. I could tell you all kinds of stories. I, I want to tell you one about a young man that, that I baptized in prison many, many years ago. We would have a, a Bible study in what was then one of the world's largest prisons. And I would have uh, in my Bible study, I would have sometimes two, three hundred men involved in Bible study. And through the course of our studies, we gave them opportunities to be obedient to God. We taught them that they, they must believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. We taught them that they must repent of their sins, turn away from their own way of thinking and direction of life, which obviously hadn't worked because they wound up where they were and, and accept God's direction. That they needed to repent, completely change direction. And that they needed to confess, <clears throat> Romans 10 verses 9 and 10, Christ is Lord and be baptized for the remission of their sins, Acts 2.38. We would say to them, or Acts 22 and verse 16, Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. And, and when a man behind bars wanted to do that, it, it complicated, it, it became complicated for us to accomplish that. What we would have to do, I would have to go down to the medical wing of the facility and make an appointment to use their whirlpool bath. I'd done it on many occasions. And with their cooperation, we would do it. But we'd have to do it in advance. And we set a date and we set a time. And because it was a date and a time, we had a number of individuals in the facility who wanted to be baptized. I'm telling you th this story in length because I want you to see the whole picture here. <clears throat> On that day, <clears throat> there were 15 men, if I remember correctly, who wanted to be baptized. And I went around to the, each cell with my credentials working behind those walls. I was able to have each man released and come with me to the medical wing of the facility where we filled up the whirlpool one time and we baptized all 15 men. On that day, of the 15 men, there was one white man, the fellow I want to tell you about, Ron, and 14, 14 black brothers. One brother after another got into the whirlpool and I baptized him. Ron was number 15. Now, what you need to know is that Ron, up to that point in his life, up to that very instant in his life, had been in prison for more than half of his life and was a member of a white racist gang. But he got into that water after 14 black men had been in that water and been baptized. Ron got in as number 15. And when he came up and when he came out of that water, all of the men gathered there, shouted, Amen, and Hallelujah. And we had a prayer, and we sang songs together. And there were tears that were shared. And Ron went back to his 
isolation sh cell in protective custody where that night attempts were made on his life because he had just violated the prison code by not only becoming a Christian but by associating with members of a different race. It, it takes courage to come to Christ for some more than others. For some, it's the family rejection that comes. It takes courage to come to Christ. For some, it's the rejection of friends. When I became a Christian, I, I lost every single quote-unquote friend I had because they were not Christians. Couldn't understand why I wanted to be one. So, back to the story. And don't ever forget it. It took courage for this woman to come to Jesus. But there's a third lesson, and one that I hope you can see. Only Jesus can offer genuine comfort. This poor woman had gone everywhere, and she had found no comfort. Did you, do you notice what he says to her in verse 34? He said to her, daughter, daughter. I love that because it's the only time that Jesus speaks to anybody like this in the New Testament. The world can't offer you this kind of comfort. Jesus offers a relationship and the genuine love and comfort that comes from a relationship to him is something that every soul needs. Well, now, what we've talked about for several minutes then in this episode and the, the last is an interruption in the story of Jairus. And we want to get back to the story of Jairus' daughter when we come back right after this. Well, back to the story in Mark 5, 35 and following. While he was still speaking, they came from the house of the synagogue official saying, Your daughter has died. Why trouble a teacher anymore? But Jesus, overhearing what was being spoken, said to the synagogue official, Do not be afraid any longer, only believe. And he allowed no one to accompany him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the synagogue official, and he saw a commotion and people loudly weeping and wailing. And he entered in and said to them, why make a commotion and weep? The child has not died, but is asleep. Okay, now we're, we're going back to that incident that occurred before we had the woman who had the problem with bleeding for 12 years. And as he's speaking in that instance, these officials came, come up and say, don't bother, she's gone. Look at verse 40 with me. They began laughing at him. But putting them out, he took along the child's father and mother and his own companions and entered the room where the child was. This is, isn't this incredible? Jesus arrives on the scene and, he's, and he says, you know, she's just sleeping. And they laugh at Jesus. Look at verse 41 and 42. Taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talathakum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl got up and began to walk, for she was 12 years old. And immediately, they were completely astounded. Amazing, isn't it? The kind of miracles that you read about in the New Testament are not the so-called miracles of the so-called faith healers today. Here is, here is a little girl who Jesus raises from the dead. And, and no matter what the illness was that had her down, it's, it's completely gone. If you've ever visited with a loved one in the hospital who had a serious illness, you know that healing, both natural healing and healing through the medical profession, and the healing that God provides takes some time. You don't ever just get
get up and walk out of the hospital healthier than you were before you went in. But here, when Jesus performs a miracle, it's, it's a miracle. And she gets up. And I want you to see something here in this story. Don't ever laugh at Jesus or what Jesus can do. These unbelievers thought it was foolishness that he would arrive on the scene and say she's going to be fine. And they laughed at him. Don't ever laugh at Jesus. Jairus was able to overcome his pride because of his suffering. And his pride brought him to his knees at the foot of Jesus. And because of that, because of that wonderful experience, his daughter is healed. Jesus does those kind of things for us when we put our faith and trust in him. And when we come back after this break, we're going, going to go into the next section of the Gospel of Mark. Watch this. Okay, take your Bibles and uh, make sure you're open to Mark chapter 6 now as we go into this next section. I want to take you back to the map. I want you to take a look at the map. Uh, we're going to look at a, a very eventful day in the life of Jesus. Uh, Jesus is around the Sea of Galilee again. Um, you, I want you to notice on the northern shores of the Sea of Galilee. And on this occasion, he hears of the death of a good friend and forerunner, John the Baptist. He, he was cruelly executed by Herod. And the disciples of John come to tell Jesus the bad news. And... And this bad news hits Jesus hard. So, so much so that he really wants to get away by himself, to be alone, to pray. But he, he's so popular at this point in time among the people that he really can't ever get alone by himself and pray. He can't get away from the crowds. Wherever Jesus goes now, there are crowds, and they, they begin to flock to him. Mark 6 and verse 34 says, When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, and he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd, and he began to teach them many things. One of the things that uh, you've probably heard me say now several times as we've studied Mark together is that the miracles that Jesus performed were miracles of compassion. When, when Jesus was moved by compassion, he performed these miracles for folks. His ministry was not about the miracles, and we'll emphasize some of that uh, as we go along through our study. The miracles were not the things that Jesus wanted to to, to be remembered for. He wanted to be remembered for his teaching. If there was anything that Jesus absolutely loved to do, it was to teach. And so here's this, here's this huge crowd following him, and though he has another desire, he's going to stop and he's going to teach them. And this might be the place right here where that teaching took place. Snap this picture when, um, when I was on the Sea of Galilee, uh, there's only so many places that events could happen around the Sea of Galilee. This seems like a likely place. It's one of those traditional places that's been assigned. And you know what's going to happen as the crowd gets together. You've read the story many times. Jesus turns to his disciples and uh, he says you know, it's, um, it's getting late. Um, these people need to have some food. Why don't you feed them? Verse 37 of uh, Mark chapter 6, um, the disciples say, where are we going to get the money to do that? To take, take a lot of money. Look at all of these people. There's, there's 5,000 people out there. 
how are we going to buy lunch or dinner for 5,000 people? And Jesus says, well, go see how much food you can find. Th through this story, I hope you can, I hope you can see that, that there is some humor in it and that Jesus is trying to get them to go a little deeper, the disciples specifically, the men who would become the apostles, to get them to think a little deeper about their spirituality. Matthew gives us the same story in the 14th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And Matthew says that they, they find, the disciples find five loaves of bread and two fish from a little boy. And they come back with that. Can you picture this? Huge group of people. The Lord has just told you to go find some food. <laughs> Where are you going to find food? And so you find this little lunch. You take it from the little boy. And you say to Jesus, okay, here, here's it. Can you see the, the, the sarcastic attitude that would have exist here? And Jesus says, okay, pass it out. <laughs> if you don't see somebody going, are you kidding me in the background? What do you think is going to happen here? There's not even enough here for one person, much less 5,000. But what the scriptures tell us is they had to, they organized the group in, in groups of 50s and 100s, and the food just kept coming and coming and coming. And Jesus commanded the apostles to pick up the scraps that were left over, and the Bible records there were 12 baskets full. Look at verse 41 and 42 of Mark 6. And he took the five loaves and the two fish and looked up toward heaven. He blessed the food and broke the loaves. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And they divided up the two fish among them all. They all ate and were satisfied. Wow. What a miracle. All of the people there ate and were satisfied. And Jesus is doing something different from what he'd done before. He had healed the sick. Now he's demonstrating his power and ability to re reproduce food and, and feed literally countless number of people. So it's no surprise that John 6 and verse 15 tells us that immediately when people saw this miracle, they wanted to take him by force and make him king. Read verse 45 and following. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead to Bethsaida, and he di dismissed the crowd. Think about that for a moment. This is a curious thing. His popularity is growing. Now he's got a huge crowd there. He's performed a miracle by feeding them. They're there, and they, they want to take him and make him king, but he wants them to go away. He wants to get away from the crowd. And the reason is he doesn't want the miracles that he's performing to be the emphasis of his ministry. He wants to go, verse 46, to the mountain to pray. And here's the lesson that we'll, we'll end with this morning and we'll pick up on next week when we get together. On the heels of one of his greatest successes in, he, in feeding the 5,000, Jesus wants to spend time in prayer. Let me suggest to you, when you're successful, pray. Be thankful to God for your great success. We'll pick up on this story when we come back next week. Hope to see you then on What Do the Scriptures Say? Bye-bye. We thank you for your interest in what do the scriptures say. We hope that you will come back to scripturesay.com often for answers to your Bible questions. See you then.